So now I'll just open the floor for questions. If you guys have questions, please raise your raise your hand or uh, type your questions in the chat box. Anyone? Uh, anyone of you have any questions? Yeah. So Kelvin asked, "What will be expected stand of Russia in such a case of two front war?" Russia yeah, I can I can read the I yes, read yes. that. Uh, so Kelvin, um, that's a good question. Actually, important question in terms of what is uh, China's expect uh, Russia's expected response to uh, to uh, uh, to any kind of a war. I mean, I think Russia has been, everybody has been sort of troubled by the whole, uh, you know, China's rise. I mean, so Russia is also, Russia has a different kind of a two front problem because Russia has, of course, China on, on the one side and the West on the other side. And so um, the, they consider the threat from the West to be more serious. And so, you know, they have sort of leaned more and more on um, on China. And I think uh, they, I, I, you know, from what I can gather, at least, uh, they do not necessarily want to abandon India. But uh, definitely, uh, my uh, concern is that they might not have much of a choice in the matter. In the sense that, you know, they, if it comes to a question uh, between uh, India and China, which side will they come down on? I think they will come down on China's side. And so we have. Uh, of course, we have the 62 experiences of the Gulf, right? And 62, um, uh, Russia was Soviet Union at that point of time was increasingly uh, uh, getting concerned about China. The split had already taken place to some extent, but then they got themselves embroiled in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which happened at ex which coincided, uh, or the rather the, the Sino-Indian um, conflict coincided with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so. Because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, uh, and because of the fact that the uh, uh, Soviets needed uh, all of the communist powers to uh, to uh, stay with them, to to be uh, you know, to be um, uh, united, uh, they were forced to sort of shift towards uh, towards China. And so that caught us by surprise. I mean, that was one of the strategic surprises that we faced uh, in '62. So uh, and it was not. I mean, I wouldn't blame them for it because it is you know it's natural that uh, that they needed uh, China support. Uh, so we have to. I think to some extent, India has to understand these different uh, compulsions that other countries have. It's not necessarily against us. Uh, it is. It was just that they that, that they faced a situation where they had no other choice, uh, and therefore they kind of as soon as the war was over and the Cuban Missile Crisis was over, of course they shifted back. But by then it was too late for us. Um, so, so today, I think we have to recognize the fact that uh, Russia has, um, far, Russia needs China far more than it needs India. I mean, they're trying to balance that a little bit, but uh, ultimately, I don't think that they will be able to. Um, uh, eventually, China will sort of force a choice on 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 Russia. So, uh, so we have to be aware of that, and that creates some problems for us because materially, for example, you know, we have. Um, uh, Russia is not as important in some respects because, of course, its its GDP is like half of India, so it's not really in that sense. It's not that important, but it's a UN Security Council member. It's a diplomatic cloud. It has, uh, you know, a significant part of our armories based on uh, or, you know, legacy weapons from Russia. We continue to buy Russian weapons, so uh, so all of these means that uh, we have to worry about the possibility that uh, Russia might abandon us. Um, um, so that is something that I think we need to keep in mind uh, because we can't ignore that uh, ignore that facet. So th that's something for us to be concerned about. I think that uh, and uh, we need to be we need to recognize that we can't um, depend entirely on on Russia. So that I think that's something that we need to in our planning that we have to uh, keep in mind. Okay. Um, Thank you, sir. Ankit, uh, do we really have the military capability to fight a two-front war or will be offensive with Pakistan? No, I mean, you know, our if you look at our overall strategy, traditionally it has been that. I mean, offensive with Pakistan and defensive, um, um, 
deter Pakistan and not offensively really speaking, but deter Pakistan and uh, defend against uh, India. I'm oh, sorry, India against 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 China, uh, and that's you know that 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 was traditionally the, the, the plan. But uh, with, if there is a two front uh, pollution, then uh, we will have to uh, uh, go from deterring to uh, essentially defending against both. I mean, so that you know that we have to we, we don't have any offensive options. Uh, whatever offensive options that, that we have, uh, if it is a two front uh, war, I think the primary objective will have to be defensive. So uh, for defensive, yeah, we, I think uh, we may be able to hold the line because partly like I said, for the reasons that I mentioned, which is that uh, defense is always uh, easier, uh, especially in the mountains. And so that could to some extent help us. I mean, can we, come, can we be sure that we'll hold the line? I don't know for sure, but uh, I do think that we have sufficient capacity to sort of hold the line. Uh, Saroj, uh, the Bay of Bengal region, Cocoa Islands, uh, provides open where China's. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, but that uh, is not as much of a threat yet uh, because uh, uh, China could uh, potentially in the future at some stage that could become a more serious threat. But as of now, uh, China doesn't have the naval capability yet to be able to. Uh, send a navy or a, or a part of his navy into the Bay of Bengal or anything of that kind. Uh, they will, I mean, that's that will be very risky for them at this stage. I mean, maybe ten years from now, when they have a couple of carrier battle groups, uh, that might change. But as of now, uh, they would run some risks. I mean, so and they don't have uh, sufficient submarine capability. They have a lot of submarines, but they're all rather poor ones. And uh, our ASW capability is increasing, anti-submarine anti warfare capability has been increasing. So I don't think that uh, they will, uh, I, I don't, I mean, those bases are a concern primarily for intelligence and other uh, other concerns, but uh, I don't think that is, as of now at least, uh, a serious military threat. Again, this changes, but uh, as of now at least it's not. Uh, Apurva, uh, given the, uh, how Afghanistan crisis is, uh, is unfolding and its uh, possible spillover effects on Pakistan, is there a possibility of uh, 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 you know uh, that is not we don't really have um, Afghanistan is not a direct problem for us in the sense that uh, the only real danger there is in terms of Pakistan using Afghanistan as a base for some of these terrorist groups, uh, but uh, that is ultimately a Pakistan problem, right? I mean, if we can if we can control Pakistan, uh, then uh, Afghanistan is not as much of a problem for us. Um, of course, what is happening? We have invested a lot in Afghanistan, and what uh, if the Taliban take over? The human rights consequences, all of that, are, are problematic. Um, uh, definitely, those are those are concerns. But as a direct security threat, uh, Pakistan doesn't really gain a whole lot by having control over Afghanistan. Uh, in terms of at least in terms of direct, means. the terrorist threat remains. But I mean, threat, terror, uh, the terror threat, as I said, uh, can be handled in other ways. And so, if we if we have a difference towards terrorism, then that sort of does uh, uh, help us. The one uh, I think to sort of Think further along uh, that those lines uh, that Apoor was questioned was uh, would would we be able to deter Pakistan if there is a two front uh, scenario? Would we be able to sort of deter uh, Pakistan because we are worried about China? I mean that is you know I don't know that. I mean that is that's I think a serious consideration uh, whether we will do another battle code, for example or something more serious if there is a serious terrorist attack uh, a serious, a serious attack. Uh, uh, like what happened uh, at Uri, uh, that I do not. I mean, that I think is uh, is a is a problem. I think that might be an issue to consider for the future. Uh, sir, we have Vyanshu. Uh, he has raised his hand. Okay, go ahead. Sure, Vyanshu, please ask your question. Sir, I have a question, mostly related to history, and that ends up to IR. Yeah. So, so my question is about Kashmir because the Pakistan challenge is mostly because of Kashmir as we have read in the historical facts 
the letter that Nehru has written in response to the Sheikh Abdullah's letter that uh, Sheikh that when Kashmir wants to join India, uh, Sh uh, Nehru has put in the argument that uh, Sheikh Abdullah should assume power and and only then the when Hari Singh uh, 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 basically wants to join hands with India. So Nehru put an argument that Sheikh Abdullah should assume power only then the independence and then, then Kashmir can join the independent state, independent India. So do you think that the democracy phobia or the, the democracy initiative, excess democracy initiative that is responsible not only for the Baramula tragedy, but also for the Pakistan challenge that we are facing from numerous generations? Yeah, uh, uh, I might take a slightly different view because first of all, it doesn't really, you know, history part of it, uh, whether Nehru made a mistake uh, with Kashmir. Uh, those are uh, for historians to decide. I, I know I, I, uh, I'm not sure that we would be able to sort of go back and do anything about it at this stage. I mean, so we have to deal with the situation that we find ourselves in. But I might also slightly disagree with you about whether Kashmir is the central uh, issue between I think the central issue is really um, the disparity in power between the two countries. I mean, Kashmir is definitely an issue. I mean, I'm not sort of, I'm not discounting Kashmir as an important issue. But um, the primary issue I think that we face, um, the primary reason, I mean, even if Kashmir were to be removed tomorrow, if we find a solution uh, for the Kashmir problem, let's say uh, both sides agree, uh, I don't think that's going to resolve India, for example. I mean, for example, 1571 and uh, the late 80s, uh, Kashmir issue had more or less disappeared from the uh, from the India Pakistan agenda. I mean, and we, we still so we, I mean, we, Kash, we had uh, a nuclear issue, we had Punjab, and only later, the late 80s, uh, did Kashmir reassert itself because of the uh, because of what happened uh, domestically within uh, within Kashmir, within Jammu Kashmir. So, it, so even if you resolve Kashmir, uh, the uh, imbalance of power would mean that there would be some sort of concern that uh, Pakistan would have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Indian power. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. I mean, we can't fall apart just to make Pakistan happy, obviously. Uh, and uh, but there's nothing that we can. There's nothing that we can really do to resolve that problem. I mean, to some extent, look, look, and there's a problem that all of India's neighbors have, right? In the sense that all of them worry about India, my, uh, primarily because of the India's enormous capacity. Um, and to some extent, we can do things like what uh, Gujarat doctrine and things like that to sort of be much more considerate to our neighbors. But you know they, that only goes so far. I mean, it doesn't really. Uh, we, we cannot really entirely resolve their problem because that we entirely resolve their concerns because that is baked into the circumstance. The circumstance of India being this large, a very powerful state, and we can't do anything about that. So our neighbors will have to. Uh, we should behave better, obviously, but uh, nevertheless, our neighbors will also have to uh, learn to uh, accept that fact. But that is never going to change. That part is not going to change, right? I mean, so uh, at least for the foreseeable future, that part is not going to change. So even if we resolve Kashmir, I don't think the India Pakistan problem is entirely would 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 be resolved. So uh, so uh, you know, so I might disagree with you on that uh, particular aspect. Ashit. Thank you, sir. Sure. Yeah. So my question is, the, the border statement that India faces at LSC, is it the result of India's hedging strategy towards China, like uh, hesitancy towards any having any formal alliance with US, less enthusiasm with war, and all that you mentioned earlier, has that made China more aggressive against India? Uh, I mean, we don't know for sure. that part. We don't know. I mean, part of it, the part of it also depends on China's calculus, right? I mean, so China has uh, become. I mean, would China have behaved better with India if India had been aligned with the United States or uh, with the West or whatever? I and we can't say for sure because um, uh, China's calculus is some, you know, to some extent a bit of a mystery because China has behaved equally aggressively with the, with. Uh, countries like Japan, South Korea, Australia, all of these are countries that are aligned, uh, allied, uh, formally militarily allied with the United States and China has been equally aggressive with them. Um, uh, and, you know, somewhat um, unnecessarily, unnecessarily so, and even with 
somewhat more uh, friendlier countries, neutral countries like New Zealand. I mean, who in the world would pick a fight with New Zealand? I mean, but you know, Austria, China has done that. So it's uh, uh, New Zealand, Sweden, Norway, Canada. I mean, these are not countries that normally you, you anybody would pick a fight with, but China has. And so China's character is somewhat difficult to understand. Um, so, uh, so I'm not sure that uh, even a formal uh, alliance with military alliance with um, uh, with the U.S. or with the Quad or anything like that uh, would have necessarily prevented uh, China from being aggressive with South India. But uh, uh, but we can at least in terms of at least in terms of uh, publicly at least in terms of theory and. Uh, understanding of IR, we can say that you know we did our best in the sense of you know we didn't ally, we tried our best to sort of resolve these problems. We tried our best to re uh, reassure China, uh, despite everything. Um, you know, China is being aggressive, and obviously we have no choice but to respond to that. And so uh, our um, alignment and alliance with uh, alignment maybe eventually shifting towards an alliance, which is, is partly uh, the consequence of that uh, changing. Uh, Chinese behavior uh, as much as Chinese China, China, China is possible. Okay. So let me read the next uh, question. Mitra Banu, what's the utility of creating theater commands to counter them? Uh, theater commands are basically, uh, in, in a sense, uh, military organizations basically fight. Uh, uh, individually so air force fights on its own and army fights on its own navy fights on its own and this is a problem everywhere in the world i mean this is not a peculiarity to india uh, or anybody else i mean every country in the world faces faces the difficulty because military forces tend to be uh, you know tend to want to do their own thing so if you actually look at I mean, all the three doctrines the navy doctrine the army doctrine air force doctrine are all uh, available publicly obviously uh, the public doctrines at least and you will see that when you read that, you know, it's like they're it's like they're planning to fight three different wars because Air Force has its own plans, Navy has its own plans, Air Force, Army has its own plans, and so it, they don't even seem like they are part of a single single uh, entity, right? I mean, and so theater commands are designed to bring all of those things together. I mean, this is uh, earlier it used to be called joinness. I mean, so there is this whole uh, uh, the U.S. began that whole joinness movement, as it were, and so. You have a lot, a lot of history of joinness uh, in India, trying effort, uh, trying to sort of create that joinness. Uh, so theater command is one form of joinness, where you say, okay, this entire, uh, this one particular sector, this one particular theater, uh, the army, uh, maybe the navy is involved, or, or the air force will fight together, and they will have the same sort of, you know, they will, they will, uh, the theater, the theater itself will be the same theater instead of army having one theater, the army command being separate from the air force command and also the all, all kinds of confusion happening. So uh, that is the idea behind the theater command. But uh, the way that we are going about it, uh, you know, there is, we, we've seen the fight between the air force and the army uh, and the CDS on this issue. So, I mean, forcing different services, uh, at some level, there is no uh, Way other than forcing different services to work together, of course, uh, ultimately that has to be done because on their own they will not do it. But the problem is that it is the CD is trying to force this, and so I think that's a problem because the uh, the uh, air force will resist because they see the CD as as doing the bidding of the army, and so it has to come from the political command, high command, and so the political high command has to sort of take a role in it and say that you know uh, this is how you do it and this is what you do uh, instead of the army forcing that through the CDS onto the Air Force. I think so that, um, so theater commands are, uh, uh, are useful and they are necessary, but uh, ultimately the way we've gone about, I think uh, it, it may create more problems uh, than solutions. Okay. Um, Pagela, why uh, doesn't India, why does India doesn't use Tibet card to maintain China's aggression of the border? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I think, the Prime Minister's uh, uh, birthday wishes is partly an indication that we might occasionally use the Tibet card or the Taiwan card, things like that. But uh, yeah, I think we have been a bit too reticent on that. Uh, uh, but you know, the, but we also have to remember that uh, we don't want to sacrifice the Tibetans for this. Uh, also, in the sense that you know, um, 
ultimately uh, it's the tibetans who will suffer uh, uh, so the question is whether we want to use that uh, unless it is absolutely absolutely necessary uh, you know uh, chinese repression in tibet will grow if uh, we do something to enhance uh, what we call the tibet card uh, so that you know, so there are lot multiple calculations i think i do agree with you that we've been a bit too restricted i mean you know we don't have to uh, you know after after um, the um, the wuhan summit for example the informal summit um, there were uh, efforts to tamp down on tibetan celebrations so i forget exactly what celebration was but there were efforts to sort of cut curtail that uh, orders going from the mea to all the ministries not to take part in any kind of tibetan i mean i don't think we have to go to that extent right i mean we don't have to uh, we should have done all that uh, but uh, we don't necessarily we we, we seem to be playing the card both ways un unnecessarily uh, and so i think we have been much too reticent uh we don't have to do that but we don't necessarily have to sacrifice the tibetan side uh, in order to sort of uh, you know, in order to sort of deal with china unless it becomes ultimately absolute illness can't really help the tibetans uh because they will have to deal with their other chinese groups right um so uh, rahul go ahead yeah uh, thank you sir uh, so my question is related to the growing convergence between china and pakistan in the maritime domain and specifically if you look at the their uh, naval cooperation in terms of how china is trying to develop their second strike capabilities or maybe in the maritime domain like uh, developing their ports and or in general you know helping pakistan mil both militarily and economically so the scholarly community in pakistan cite the the growing convergence between india and us as the reason for their growing for the sino pak nexus in the maritime domain so how do you look at this situation first and then what could uh, india possibly do what what possible steps india could do to counter such a growing nexus in the maritime domain thank you yeah uh, thank you rahul uh, no i don't think there is a direct correlation between uh, the state of uh, sino pak relations and state of uh, india us relations i mean there is no never been a correlation between them. so Uh, for example, in the 1980s or uh, 70s, our relations with uh, with the US was quite bad. Um, it kind of began to improve in the 80s a little bit, but uh, it was quite bad. Uh, but that was a time when they were transferring nuclear weapons, so nuclear weapons technology. I mean, you know, so this, this is not. There is, uh, uh, if you go back into much of uh, the last 40, 50 years, 60 years, uh, there is no correlation between those. Two. I mean, if that was, I mean, you know. if there was a correlation then we could do something about it but there is no correlation that the that, that relationship has become stronger and stronger over the years and as i said right in the beginning uh, of my talk uh, that's natural i mean there is a there is a natural reason why they would come together right i mean and so we had to accept that part that they would be uh, that they would they that they had that common interest and that therefore they would uh, they would work together i mean i, I don't think if we stop um, the our uh, closer relationship to the united states that it would necessarily have any uh, benefit on the sino uh, uh, sino park uh, relationship uh, specifically on the maritime front also i mean you know, i on the maritime thing uh, i am not overly bothered by china putting up bases or have a whatever within india in india's vicinity of course we also do it on their side uh, that's natural on both sides we do it to them they do it to us but it's also that you know if you are if you are uh, an adversary to another country if you're going to go to war do you really want to put up bases right next to somebody else's territory right i mean it's, uh, if there were really military bases we would take them out uh, in the first 24 hours of war I mean, they they're, they're going to be extremely vulnerable right i mean so, so i not i mean they are not very very worried about them actually having military base because they'd be they'd be sitting ducks if they if they actually came to a war the, the larger collaboration we can't really do very much about Uh, because we do it to them they do it to us it's natural it's, it's expected okay thanks um uh ramakrishna what's the possibility of a two front challenge uh, for china with india and other asian countries in the east can india deter china by it? the problem uh, ramakrishna is that yes we are doing that partly of course we are our relationship with uh, with uh, southeast asian countries with, uh, with singapore with vietnam now with indonesia uh, have all improved dramatically uh, vietnam has always been good but it's it's improved, improved even better even more uh, it's improved of course very dramatically with japan and 
uh, Australia. The problem is, of course, that even if all of us combine together, uh, we are no match for China. Right? In the sense that overall, China's power uh, has crossed what might be characterized as a security threshold. That is, China is already well over 50% of the overall wealth. I mean, wealth is not the same thing as power, but it's a kind of a rough measure. Uh, is already much more, much stronger, much more, uh, much stronger than, uh, much more strong than all of these countries combined together, right? I mean, and so, uh, and of course, that's just the gross uh, numbers and gross sort of uh, material uh, distribution. But um, there are also other difficulties that we will face, which is that we're all spread out. Uh, we don't have easy access to each other. It's very difficult to coordinate um, uh, and. Uh, you know, uh, three or four relatively weak countries related to China, weaker countries coming together always means that uh, whoever does the moves first is likely to be the target of uh, target for China. So nobody will move first. And so so there are a whole host of problems. So I, I unless uh, uh, the United States uh, becomes an anchor for that kind of a, uh, partnership between all of these countries, uh, uh, these countries can't come together. And, and, you know, uh, the U.S. can now do that because the U.S. is stronger than China and therefore it can provide that, uh, be that anchor. If the U.S., of course, becomes weaker than China, then we will have no nobody to sort of bring these countries together. And uh, essentially, then we will all be on our own um, uh, dealing with China as best as we can on our own. So, I, you know, so I, I think that that limits our capacity to come together uh, just by Asian countries alone, because uh, even together we are not strong enough to sort of match China. Uh, it's already past that stage. Maybe 15, 20 years back, maybe we could have done that, uh, but not now anymore. Okay. Uh, Debendra, how do we assess China's approach in establishing footprint in South Asia through its influence? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they, again, that is perfectly understandable from their perspective because all of these countries. Um, in China, Pakistan has been the most visible, obviously, but uh, all of these countries, as I said, uh, do feel uh, the pressure of India's power. Right? I mean, as as they, our power does impinge on all of these countries. Um, and so they have always looked to external allies to balance against uh, India to some extent uh, at different points of time. The, point, the problem is that nobody has been there to come to their assistance. Right. Nobody has been willing to come to their assistance because why would somebody want to align with uh, Sri Lanka against India? Because India has much more to offer, uh, or Nepal against India. So there hasn't been. Uh, occasionally, the U.S. may have made some sympathetic noises to one or the other, but uh, there hasn't been any country that's been consistently willing to come to their assistance. So they have, they they would periodically make these efforts, like Jai Bhadra in the 1980s, uh, uh, but nobody to sort of help them. Like that in a constant sense. Today they have China, right? I mean, China is interested, China is capable, and therefore uh, China, uh, you know, China will be welcomed because of these countries do have that uh, worry about India. But also, you know, obviously China is uh, offering uh, investment and infrastructure uh, in a manner that India can't, right? and they, or India is uh, too incompetent to. I mean, we don't have the money either, but bureaucratically also we are much too incompetent to be able to provide that as it's like almost every major project in Sri Lanka, for example, Sri Lankans came to us first and then we couldn't deliver and then they went to the Chinese. And so so we can't really blame them for that. I mean, so yes, they, China will, China has an interest in countering India and South Asia uh, to keep us occupied in the neighborhood. Uh, our neighbors have an interest in bringing China in to sort of counter India. And of course, India does the same thing again. Like I said, India does the same thing to a more limited extent because our capability is much lesser than uh, China, uh, we do that in Southeast Asia, um, you know, that, that uh, uh, and now we are trying to do that along with uh, Australia and Japan and uh, the US and trying to bring together, put together some kind of an infrastructure package uh, to help all of these countries. So, so if we can't do it on our own, we're kind of trying to do that uh, together. But that is, that is to be expected. That is natural. Uh, we can do things, some things to sort of make it more difficult for China to do this by being better friends to our neighbors. And of course, our neighbors were going to exploit this because our neighbors, just like we did during the Cold War, exploited both the United States and the Soviet Union to get the best from both sides. 
we should expect that our neighbors will also do the same thing. They will try to exploit the competition between India and China and try to get from both sides. I mean, try to get what they can uh, more from each side. And uh, that's the unfortunate nature of the game. We don't really have much choice but to play that game. Right? So um, we are you know, we are left with no other no other uh, viable option. Uh, Nuharika, what will be the implications of U.S.-China rivalry on Pakistan? Um, uh, to some extent, I suppose they will benefit in the sense that uh, China will need Pakistan even more than uh, it does now. Uh, partly because China doesn't have very many good allies. I mean, you know, one of the one of the mysteries as far as uh, Chinese diplomacy is concerned is why they're making so many enemies with such speed. Uh, unnecessary, right? I mean, it just makes no sense. But then now they are essentially left with Pakistan and North Korea, right? I mean, they're not really, I mean, uh, maybe Malaysia, uh, maybe Cambodia, but these are really small countries. Um, uh, so Pakistan is much more capable uh, of their allies. And so I think um, uh, it's not just the US uh, China rivalry, but also uh, the fact that China. Has antagonized so many, so many, so many other countries that uh, China has. Uh, China needs Pakistan more and more. Uh, so I think that relationship will get strengthened over time. Uh, of course, Pakistan has its own needs because of India, and so they will also be interested in that sort of partnership, uh, and they will exploit the fact that U.S. and China are uh, are rivals. I mean, that helps them too. So because China needs them because of that. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, what are the prospects of China supporting the uh, Taliban regime in Afghanistan? Uh, I mean, Afghanistan is a bit, bit of a mystery in terms of how what these kind of different countries are kind of trying to do. Uh, I suspect that they will sort of uh, uh, ride on the coattails of Pakistan in Afghanistan. Um, they uh, they do have an interest, of course, uh, because they don't want militancy spreading from Afghanistan into into China. Uh, uh, you know, they they don't uh, want militancy in the Central Asian region. Um, so that is part of the problem. But uh, I mean, I think that's a bigger, bigger concern for them than, uh, uh, you know, any direct, I mean, so people talk about this oh, minerals and things like that. I, I don't think that's a primary concern that uh, that, uh, that China has vis -vis Afghanistan. I think the bigger concern is the political and ideological concern. Um, and of course, they would like to have a friendly regime uh, in uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan because it's one more country that would be friendly to uh, uh, to China. So, but I mean, I, the situation is so fluid that I'm not sure that all of this is assumed based on the assumption that, of course, that the Taliban wins uh, power in, uh, in Kabul. I, yeah, you know that remains to be seen. I think, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm so I'm not sure exactly what will happen in Afghanistan. So a lot of what China might do in Afghanistan will depend on what the what the conditions in Afghanistan itself would be. Uh, so I think really, uh, I don't really have a good answer. Sorry, to a roundabout sort of way of saying that, but um, I'm trying to wait and see on that. Uh, Shadendu, uh, what? Again, so the same question. I I am not sure what we will uh, uh, what China will do in Afghanistan. Um, we don't have uh, we don't have a direct access to Afghanistan, so we are kind of constrained in that respect. I mean, going through Iran is means that you are essentially uh, we are basically stuck with Iran. Uh, we are um, uh, uh, we are subject to their whims and fancies and their interests, self-interest. So we don't know exactly. You know, we can't really do that. Um, so, so in a sense, geographically, we are kind of stuck because uh, we are stuck because we don't have, we don't, we can't do really anything directly vis uh, Afghanistan. Of course, um, if uh, Indian strategists had recognized this uh, much earlier, and you know, <laughs> if we had uh, our claim to. Um, Kadu and uh, uh, Park occupied Kashmir. If we had sort of uh, retaken that part of uh, the Kashmir territory that we claim, obviously we would have had direct access to Afghanistan. Uh, 
and that would have significantly reduced Pakistan's leverage that it has over other countries. It would have cut off China from Pakistan physically. So they, I mean, well, we haven't done that. So at this stage, I'm not sure that we have much of an option. So we are basically uh, geography in a sense limits us uh, in that sense. Why is India's foreign policy always defensive? Uh, uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, the overall, uh, from an IR theory perspective, I would say that India has been defensive because India has uh, India is the most dominant power uh, within South Asia, so we haven't really faced a significant threat. And until recently, China was not seen a significant threat. I think that's uh, that maybe explains why India has been defensive because we have been, in a sense, a uh, status quo power uh, uh, within the region. Um, and so that means that we didn't really have uh, uh, we didn't have anything that we needed really. Um, that we wanted to, we needed to go out and get to our, uh, in that sense, our objectives were uh, largely defensive. Um, um, uh, I think that may have more to do with it, more to do uh, as an explanation. Uh, uh, there may be other cultural uh, factors also in terms of the nature of India's ideology, India's sort of uh, ideological sort of um, um, legacy with the aftermath of the uh, independent struggle, the way we, uh, uh, the nature of our leadership and things like that. But I think the more important reason probably is uh, the, the structural condition that we are a fairly secure state. Uh, we didn't feel any significant threats and therefore we kind of responded defensively to the threats that we did face. Okay. Um, thank you. I'm